The goal of a statistical analysis is to understand something about the world, but the way in which the data are collected has implications for the proper interpretation of the results, and collecting data poorly can lead to invalid conclusions. If you went to a local Tea Party Republican meeting and asked the attendees whether they had a favorable or unfavorable opinion of Barack Obama's track record as president, would the results be representative of the entire U.S. population? Of course not. Tea Party members represent only one end of the spectrum of viewpoints in the country. In this session, we're going to think about how the ways in which data are collected can affect the results. We'll look at types of studies, methods for obtaining samples, and possible sources of bias. In order to make sense of the world around them or to convince others to join their side, people often use whatever information is readily available to them. This often comes in the form of anecdotal evidence, evidence that is based on isolated personal experiences and is often shared as a short story called an anecdote. For example, we had a record-breaking summer of hot weather in Colorado. Anthropogenic global warming must be true. Or, my cousin smoked peppermint before taking the ACT and got a 36, so peppermint must be a mind enhancer. Anecdotes are usually interesting, personally relevant, and give a face to an issue. Unfortunately, anecdotes rely on a cursory an analysis of a single or just a few in instances of some phenomenon. But there's really little reason to believe that any other instance should be similar or shouldn't be similar. When we do a statistical analysis, we look at trends in groups. Although these trends also can't tell you if any particular instance is going to follow the trend, you can at least have some idea of whether a particular anecdote is typical or unusual since this statistical analysis involves information from many different individuals. So if we don't want to rely on anecdotes that we happen to have available to us, how can we more reliably gather information? Well, one option is an observational study. This is a study that collects information about subjects only through observation, as opposed to doing something to the subjects to see how they respond. For example, a researcher goes into a classroom, watches students, and counts the number of times that male and female students raise their hands to answer a question. Or a researcher goes through public records to determine the number of car accidents in a year and the color of each car involved. Or a researcher sends a survey to a bunch of college students asking how much TV they watch, which shows they prefer, and how often they go on dates. Observational studies can be very useful for gathering information about real people with their real lives in the real world, and can often be relatively cheap despite gathering information about a lot of different subjects. Observational studies are also good for situations in which it may be impractical or unethical to run an experiment. One limitation to observation studies, though, is uh, lurking variables. These are unobserved variables that are related to those under study. For example, you might look at monthly data of ice cream sales and shark attacks and see that when ice cream sales are higher, shark attacks are also higher. From this, you might conclude that ice cream sales and shark attacks are related. Hmm, do sharks like ice cream? But here, the temperature is a lurking variable. When it's warmer, in the summer, say, more people eat ice cream and more people go to the beach, and so more shark attacks happen. Ice cream sales and shark attacks aren't actually related to one another. They're each related to the lurking variable of temperature. You can only collect but so much information while observing, and you can never be 100% sure that there is some important unobserved variable that's driving the relationships you see in, in your observations. So when it's fe feasible, it's often informative to conduct an experiment. This is a study in which researchers assign subjects to different conditions and observe the outcome for each group. This is instead of just hoping that some people will be in one condition and some people in another, and then observing. In this case, the researchers actively ensure that subjects will be in each condition. The treatment is one of the different conditions of an experiment corresponding to the actions that are done or not done to or for the subjects. For example, a treatment could be attending a new training session or not attending a new training session. The treatment could be eating a high fiber diet or eating a low fiber diet, taking an aspirin each morning, or not taking any aspirin regularly. Note that in this, these cases, not attending a new training session or not taking an aspirin are called control treatments. In addition to simply ensuring that all conditions are represented, 
Experiments provide a very useful mechanism for removing the potential for lurking variables via random assignment. Random assignment is where you assign subjects to treatments in, exper in an experiment without respect to their particular characteristics, that is to say, randomly. When a subject's treatment is assigned randomly, the fact that they're in group A or group B isn't related to any other variable. It was random, after all. This means that there cannot be any lurking variables. Lurking variables are related to the variables under study, even though they aren't observed. If the treatment is randomly assigned, then it isn't related to any other pre-study variables. Under random assignment, each of the treatment groups is equivalent, on average, to the full population. Since the only difference between the groups is their treatment, any difference in outcomes for the two groups must be due to the difference in treatments. Recall that in quantitative studies, we are generally interested in an entire population, but we usually only have data for a smaller sample. Since we want to make inferences about the entire population, how we select the sample becomes very important. This is called sampling, that is to say, the way subjects are chosen for a sample. If the sample isn't representative of the population, our inferences are going to be incorrect. One type of sample is a convenience sample. This is where a group of subjects are selected because they happen to be readily available. For example, the students in my class. Another example, a local elementary school. Convenience samples are easy to find. After all, you just pick whoever's at hand. This makes the study easier to conduct. However, there's no guarantee that those who are convenient are anything like the population as a whole. If you take a convenience sample in rural Nebraska, the subjects may not be much like people in inner city New York. A special type of convenience sample is a volunteer sample. This is where a group of subjects is selected because they volunteered to participate. For example, a survey that's on the internet. People go to a website and they take a poll, they're volunteering to participate. Most medical research also consists of volunteer samples. In volunteer samples, people have different motivations for volunteering for a study. And some of those motivations could be related to the variables under study. That is to say, they could be lurking variables. When you have a volunteer sample, you have to ask yourself, how could the people who volunteer be different than the people who don't volunteer? For example, suppose the administration of Regis University puts a poll on the Regis website to determine how students feel about the cafeteria food at the university. To participate, students have to volunteer to go to the website and fill out the poll. Students who feel particularly strongly about the cafeteria, either favorably or unfavorably, are more likely to go to the effort of filling out the poll than students who don't feel strongly. The results for the sample will likely show more extreme views than the views for the entire population of students. Instead of a convenience sample, one could use a random sample. This is where a group of subjects is randomly selected from the entire population. For example, the U.S. Census Bureau runs a survey called the American Community Survey. They select households randomly to participate in this survey. Marketing companies often use random digit dialing telephone surveys to collect information about a random sample of adults in America. Just like an experiment with random assignment to treatment groups, subjects in a random sample and subjects not in a random sample are going to be equivalent on average because participation in the study isn't related to any other variable. After all, it's random. Random samples are most likely to be representative of a population. However, it can be logistically difficult to achieve a true random sample. Think about a random sample of adults in the U.S. The population covers a large area, and some people are difficult to reach. And there's no master list of the population from which to draw names. We gather information about samples with the goal of making inferences about the entire population. That is, we compute numerical summaries of data gathered for the sample, that is to say statistics, and then we use these to make inferences about what the numerical summary would be for the entire population, that is the parameter. This process is called generalization, that is, applying conclusions drawn from a sample to an entire population. For example, on average, student test scores in this sample were higher for students enrolled in the study skills program than those who weren't. Therefore, student test scores across the whole university would be higher, on average, for students enrolled in the study skills program than for those who don't enroll. We move from information about the sample, these particular students who were enrolled in the study skills program, to the population, all students at the university. If the sample is representative of the population, these inferences are often likely to be correct. 
But there are a number of points where the inferences could go awry. This is called bias. Bias is a systematic difference in the sample statistic from the population's parameter due to some outcomes occurring more often in the sample than they do in the population. That is to say, the sample is not fully representative of the population. For example, suppose men and women like the color blue at different rates. Imagine that you're trying to find out how many people in the population of all students like the color blue, but your sample has far more men than women, even though they're about equal in the population. Your estimate of the population parameter of the proportion of students who like the color blue is going to be biased since the sample doesn't reflect the population in terms of its composition of men and women. Bias can creep into a study in several different ways. First, there's sampling bias. This is bias due to the sampling procedure. That is to say, we have non-representative responses because we have a sample that isn't representative of the entire population. A particular type of sampling bias is called non-response bias. This is sampling bias that is due to subjects choosing not to respond to a particular question in systematic but unknown ways. For example, in this particular cartoon, we see a prisoner who's answering a telephone survey. He says, oh sure, I have lots of time to answer your survey. What are your questions? The point of the cartoon is that some people have a lot of time on their hands, and those people are more likely to respond to a telephone survey than busy people who don't have as much time on their hands. Another type of bias is instrument bias. This is bias that is inherent in the measurement instrument, uh, like the survey questionnaire. This could be perhaps due to leading questions or differences in people's interpretation of the meaning of words. For example, in this cartoon, the mayor says, I want to see some good results. And his assistant says, sure, we'll ask people whether they think your performance is good, better, or great. Clearly, this instrument is going to produce biased results. A related type of bias is response bias, not to be confused with non-response bias, of course. Response bias is bias that is due to subjects modifying their responses to reflect what they feel the researchers want to hear. Sometimes this is called social desirability bias because people respond based on what they see as socially desirable behavior. For example, in this cartoon, we see a couch potato who's responding to a telephone survey and he says, oh sure, I exercise regularly, when clearly he doesn't. He knows that exercise is good and wants to give a good impression of himself. Sometimes the very fact of conducting a study can alter people's behavior, causing bias. This is called the Hawthorne effect. This is bias due to the presence of researchers. For example, workers may take fewer breaks and be on their best behavior when the auditors are around. Somewhat related to the Hawthorne effect is a kind of bias due to a quirk of human psychology in which believing you are receiving something beneficial actually produces a beneficial effect, even if the thing that you got doesn't really carry any benefits. This is called the placebo effect. This is a difference in the outcome due only to believing that one is receiving something beneficial. A couple of examples of placebos would be receiving a sugar pill instead of cold medicine in a drug trial, or going to a training session with no substantive content. The placebo effect is why many, particularly medical studies, are going to use a placebo control instead of a do-nothing control. That is to say, they may give you a sugar pill instead of just saying, I hope you feel better after you get a cold. This is because they want to find the effect of, say, the drug beyond the psychological effect of believing that you're getting something beneficial. The Hawthorne and placebo effects are sometimes why we conduct a blind study. This is a study in which the participants don't know which treatment they're receiving, so they can't uh, alter their behavior or their responses based on what they think the results should be. Similarly, it's also possible for bias to enter in during the analysis phase. Sometimes the analysts may see an effect because they would really like for there to be one. This is why sometimes we conduct a double-blind study. A double-blind study is a blind study in which even the analysts don't know which group is receiving the treatment. Once they have determined whether there is an effect or a difference between the treatment groups, a third party reveals which group received which treatment. For example, in trials of extrasensory perception, it's possible that the person conducting the trial could provide body language that cues the participant uh, toward one response or another. Similarly, the analyst who may want to prove or disprove the possibility of ESP might inadvertently see or results in one way or another based on their preconceptions. This is why in ESP tests, frequently the people who are conducting the study have no idea what the results should be, 
And the people who, an who analyze the results have no idea what the correct or true results are until they've made their conclusions and a third party can say whether they, they were correct or not. To sum it all up, the principle behind thinking about bias is to reflect on all of the possible reasons why the sample might be systematically different from the population, and then attempt to eliminate or minimize these influences so that we can generalize by making inferences about the population based on the results from our particular sample.